Led Zeppelin's first album introduced the band's unrelenting hard rock style that would go on to thrill audiences worldwide. Their second album, recorded the same year in 1969, mostly while on tour supporting their first record, really cemented their place as one of the biggest bands in the world, going from playing clubs to selling out arenas, with radio hits Whole Lot Love and Ramble On. For the first album, the band were able to hole up in Olympic Studios and complete the job in only 30 hours over a three-week period. It was actually recorded before they even had a record deal and was solely financed by Jimmy Page himself, so haste was in his best interest. With the band doing all they could to promote their debut record, they ended up being on the road for some time and just weren't able to dedicate a prolonged amount of time away from touring in order to record the second album. Because of this, they ended up recording as they travelled, with sessions taking place in both the UK and the USA, and even a brief session in R&D studios nicknamed The Hut in Vancouver to record vocal and harmonica overdubs for the song Bring It On Home. Their first album was engineered by Glyn Johns, with Jimmy Page as producer. Jimmy and Glyn were like-minded when it came to the sonic approach for the record, in that space and ambience were important elements to capture to convey a sense of size, and this was a style that would continue into the recording of their second record. This method was crucially employed when recording John Bonham's drums, for example. For the most part, this was done with two mics over the kit, with one placed to Bonham's right above the ride cymbal area and one directly above the snare. A third mic would be placed in front of the bass drum also to catch the low frequencies not picked up properly by the overhead mics. This setup is known as the Glyn Johns method and is important for the sound, but not the only important thing. Kramer recalls, the thing that separated him from his contemporaries, which John and I discussed, was the thing about the drum kit being balanced, not only from a tonal point of view, but from a volume point of view also. It was this belief that cymbals shouldn't overpower the drums. You should be able to put one microphone in front of the set, and it should work. In the 40s and 50s, there weren't mics all over the place, and some of those recordings were incredible. John came out of that way of thinking. The core was complete control and balance. Eddie remembers using the Neumann KM54s for the overheads, and an AKG D30 on the kick drum. Although different mic combinations were used in many different studios, including the ones used at Mystic Studios in LA here, his skins were tuned very tight like a traditional jazz player's kit, which gave the drums a pitch and a ring that was quite distinctive from other rock drummers. Eddie recalls, He always used to come in and give me a big bear hug and say, You're going to give me a good sound today, aren't you? In a kind of funny, threatening voice. For Jimmy's guitar, the way they created space was by placing a microphone close to the cloth of the amp, as would be standard practice, but also having one placed around 10 feet away, and then blending in the two signals to give the listener a sense of space and size. Although Jimmy Page was the producer, Eddie Kramer was one of the many engineers that worked on the album, and ultimately ended up mixing it along with Jimmy, with Eddie handling all the technical details. Jimmy Page with a Gibson Les Paul is now a classic image, but for the first Led Zeppelin record, he actually used a Fender Telecaster. This particular guitar, with a very distinctive paint job, was given to him by Jeff Beck when he replaced him in the Yardbirds. Jimmy had experience of using a Les Paul live, as he had a three pickup Black Beauty along with the Telecaster. This encounter left him impressed with how the guitar's humbucker pickups offered more options when it came to feedback control, and it was at this point that Joe Walsh offered him his 1960 Les Paul Sunburst for $1,200 while he was on tour in the States playing at the Fillmore East in New York. Jimmy snapped this up and it became his number one from then on, and it was the main guitar he used on Led Zeppelin II. It wasn't stock when he bought it from Walsh, as the neck of the guitar had been shaved down, which actually shaved off the serial number, meaning it became impossible to properly date. It could be a 1959 or a 1960. The pickups were original Seth Lover PAFs, as was stock at the time. Jimmy said about the Les Paul, I played it on Whole Lot of Love and What Is and What Should Never Be, and then decided it was for me. It was definitely going to be the Les Paul from then on. I always wanted to make a change for each album sonically, and that was my first decision for Led Zeppelin II. Another guitar that definitely featured on the album was his 67 Vox Phantom 12. The acoustic parts were played on his Vox Country Western model. This can be heard very prominently on Ramble On. The Vox Country Western is really a rebadged Italian-made Echo 6. This is a fairly inexpensive brand and even has a bolt-on neck. Jimmy's main amps at the time were the Marshall Super Lead and Marshall Super Bass. His Super Bass was modified by Tony Frank and it's unclear what these mods entailed as it's quite possible to effectively turn a super bass into a super lead. Some say his main recording amp from Led Zeppelin II onwards was the super bass, but it's likely both were used over the years, and it's very hard to judge from pictures as they look identical from the front. He also used the Fox UL412 hybrid amp head in the studio, an amp he'd been using since the Yardbirds days. 
The amp was known as the Super Beetle, as it was Vox's response to the Beatles' request in a higher-powered amp in order to be heard over their screaming fans. You can clearly see in the studio recording photos that there are definitely some Rickenbacker speaker cabinets present. This is the transonic cabinet that Jimmy had originally paired with the Vox, and it's likely that the cabinets contained Altec 417 speakers, although this can't be confirmed for sure. The Vox amp and Rickenbacker cabinet combination was what he used to record Whole Lot of Love, and for the solo, the Solar Sound Tone Bender and the Vox Wah slightly dipped to accentuate the mid-frequencies. He did use the Rotor Sound Tone Bender Mark II also during the album. Another effect that he used can be seen in this photo. This is the Long Tom Echo Deluxe by Vox that was initially made popular by Hank Marvin in the Shadows. Whole Lot of Love also has a theremin part played by Jimmy. This occurs in the breakdown and is followed by another very distinctive part, Eddie Kramer recalls. The whole thing with Jimmy was that we liked to leave in little mistakes and ad-libs. It added to the whole vibe, so on Whole Lot of Love, we left in that cough at the beginning. Then on Robert's way down inside vocal part, we found that we had leakage from track 8, a previous vocal track that we couldn't seem to lose. So Jimmy and I cranked up the reverb and left it in. Big mistake, happy mistake. An example of the recording complexities caused by the relentless touring schedule meant that this song, like most of the album for that matter, was recorded at different times in many different studios. For example, Whole Lot of Love kickstarted the sessions at Olympic Studios in April 69, moving on to A&M Studios in Hollywood for further overdubs, and actually finished at A&R Studios in New York. They were all over the place, Kramer says, of the sessions. They had this huge truck of tapes, and once they were assembled, he and Page completed the mixes in just two days, on August 29th and 30th at A&R Studios in New York. On the most primitive console you could imagine, with only two pan pots available, Kramer said. Fortunately, a lot of submixing had been done previously, so some tracks contained the multiple instruments, and in many cases, basic effects had also been committed to tape at the time of recording. But that didn't keep Kramer and Page from creating more effects and making the most of these two pan pots. They were able to dramatically move instruments and vocals from one side of the stereo field to the other, such as drawing the middle section of Whole Lot of Love and towards the end of what is and what should never be, and also for creating more subtle stereo effects using reverb and delay. Of course, when talking about the effects used on Led Zeppelin II, it's interesting to note that while the studio was equipped with Pultec equalizers, Teletronics limiters, and other now classic gear, there were no effects processes in the modern sense. Reverb was generated via three EMT-140 plates, and delay was achieved using a three-head reel-to-reel tape recorder. The delay results in the time it takes for the tape to physically travel between the record and playback heads. Another example of effects created using reel-to-reel tape recorders is the strange vocal sound on the chorus of What Is and What Should Never Be, produced by Phasing Plant's voice using two synchronized tape recorders. The same track was played back simultaneously on two machines at the same time, with the tape in one machine playing tape that was uneven. This produced a warbling effect by modulating the second playback in and out of phase with the first. Less obvious production techniques used throughout the album include panning a guitar or other instrument to one side of the stereo field and position a reverberated version of the same sound to the other, as on the opening riff to Whole Lot of Love. Page was also fond of backwards reverb, where the tape is flipped over and the reverb recorded to an empty track while it's playing in reverse. Then when the tape is turned back over, the backwards reverb is heard starting before the sound it was applied to. Page had said that he used this on the slide part during the chorus of Whole Lot of Love, and at other points on the album. John Paul Jones' setup for the album was his 61 Fender Jazz Bass, played through an acoustic 360 bass head and 361 cabinet. No longer production, this was quite a common setup for rock bassists at the time, and it was used both live and in the studio. Robert Plant felt that this album was quite a turning point for him as a vocalist. After feeling that he didn't get any credit for his work on the first album, he began to have severe doubts about his ability to carry on. During Led Zeppelin 1, as far as I was concerned, I thought I was going to leave the band anyway. I didn't feel that comfortable because there were a lot of demands on me vocally, which there were all the way through the Led Zeppelin thing. And I was quite nervous and I didn't really get into enjoying it until the second album. I think the vast majority can agree that he sure did get into it as the vocal performances are truly incredible and iconic. Thankfully, the record buying public at the time agreed also, with the album topping the charts and becoming the biggest selling album of the year, deposing Abbey Road from the number one spot and keeping the Rolling Stones' Let It Bleed from number one also. It marked a shift for the popularity of heavier rock, and the band of course went on to make many more classics, with their blueprint now firmly defined. <laughs> 